It did. I ju Jordan one Chicago's were like sixty dollars. Nowadays they're like five hundred. Uh. Huh. All right. Well, I hope that this runs long enough. It'll be interesting. I guess we'll go as uh, until the battery runs out on the camera. So, this should be okay. Let's see. A hundred. Oh no, that's almost two hours. We got plenty of time. All right, that's good. All right, you guys are like really feel spread out today. Maybe I need to walk closer here. All right. So we're on page twenty-six. And if you have uh, that lesson, we're like on the second page. Oh, we might not be on 26 in your book, though. Yeah, 26. Right. Is it 26? All right. Very good. I have some extra stuff, so uh, the part that's on the bottom of 25 is actually on my 26. All right, so last week we were talking about the fact that Jesus is true what? God, God and man. true man. All right. So true God and true man, and um, we're going. We looked at yes, sir. Uh, does anybody have an extra writing utensil? Excellent. Somebody's going to have one first for me. All right, I got one first. Here you go, man. Okay. Oh, nice pass. Should like think about keeping that one. Oh, pass. Oh wait, that would be that would be breaking the. <laughs> Not six. Not six. The seventh commandment, right? Seventh seal. Here's how I remember this, right? I don't mean to be crass or anything, but um, six sex. Six sex. So no adultery. Seven seal. So there's a little bit of alliteration happening there. It works. That's how I've always remembered it in my, in my mind. I said deadly steal someone's pencil. Um, well, if you accidentally do it, it's still technically breaking the commandment. Uh, what you probably haven't broken, what you haven't broken if it's accidental is that you haven't broken the Tenth Commandment, right? Coveting your neighbor's stuff, right? So if you uh, purposely steal somebody's pen, because it's a cool pen, right? Um, then, it's, then it's the Seventh Commandment and probably the Tenth Commandment, right? Uh, yes, Joel. It sounds like your neighbor has like something cool. I'm like, oh, I want something like that. Is that for committing whatever it's called? Hmm. Like in your body, uh, yourself. You oh, yeah. yeah. You we steal. actually talked about this last year yeah, in confirmation I class. I don't know. I don't know. All right. We actually talked about that last year, Joel. Um, <laughs> since you're an eighth grader now, um, but uh, it, it would depend on intent. It's not, it's not wrong to say, oh my gosh, Pastor Schultz has like some of the coolest cardinals jackets and gear, right? And I'd really like though to have those things, right? That's not necessarily sinful, right? Really You're, because just just wanting something isn't isn't a sin. Now if it if that uh, if that leads you to be jealous of me, if it leads you to be envious, if it leads you to not like me, if it leads you to actually take my stuff, right? That, then you're breaking the Tenth Commandment, right? Or, or if it leads you to not be satisfied with the gifts that God gives, right? Oh my gosh, God, God doesn't love me. Why doesn't he give me these things, right? I mean, that sounds silly, but people think that way, right? I mean, why, why, why can't I have those things, God? And they become discontent with what God gives, right? Then, then you're breaking the tenth commandment. All of those, all of those would be ways that you would be breaking it. All right. So, not a not a terrible question. That's good. All right. So, um, Jesus, true God, true man. And we looked at uh, we looked at last week. We um, yeah, we looked at uh, uh, kind of uh, what that means and and how the catechism, how Lutheran, how the Bible. Uh, talks about that and how Lutherans talk about that. And, and then we looked at just Bible passages that kind of show, that point to the fact that Jesus is true God and Jesus is true man. And we looked at those uh, human feelings and emotions and attributes and godly um, attributes and things like that, right? So so that brings us to number five. And number five then really gets at um, kind of, so it takes those Bible passages that we looked at at the end of the last week and kind of categorizes it all for us as to... Uh, um, Jesus being true God and true man. So it's kind of just fill in the blank here. Uh, we know that Jesus is true God because scriptures show that Jesus has 
Uh, three main things. Three main things. And we've already talked about the first one on the first page. It was the first thing that we talked about. Um, Jesus has divine what? Go back to like question number one and look at what we talked about and fill in the blank. Jesus has divine what? Like what? What did we? Well, what? What's Jesus called? Jesus is called Yahweh. Yahweh, and he's called Christ, and he's called Messiah, and he's called lots of other things. He's called Creator, right? John one would say that he's a Creator. So, what does he have? Divine names. Names. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Jesus has divine names, right? Only God has divine names. Nobody is going to look at Peter Yarnell and call him Yahweh, right? I mean, if he if he if he starts a cult, if he starts a cult and he gets some gullible people to join the cult, like really gullible, really gullible, right? Uh, 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 you know, the whole uh, I don't know. Maybe you could go with you know burning bush, red hair, Yahweh. Maybe you can convince some people. Um, right, who are really gullible. Your phone fell just by the way. Um, but, uh, right, nobody's going to call him Yahweh. Right? Nobody's going to call Ian Savior or Messiah or Redeemer or Creator. Right? Nobody's going to do that. So only, only God has divine names. God has divine names. Jesus has all kinds of divine names in the Bible. Names that are used for God, for Yahweh, are also used for Jesus. So Jesus has divine names. That's one of the ways that we can look at Scripture and say, oh, Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. Do you know what divine means? Divine, divine means uh, of God. All right? Godly. Um, when, uh, uh, anyways, that's good. Divine, divine means God. God. Um, God. Um, Not, no, not really. Not really. Divine has to do with God. So, so when, uh, when somebody looks, right, so when somebody stares into your eyes and a boyfriend or girlfriend stares into your eyes and says, oh, you're just so divine, right? They are, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, putting on you characteristics of godliness, right? Because you're so awesome or beautiful or magnificent, whatever, right? So when somebody stares in your eyes and goes, oh my gosh, you're so divine, that's what they're doing. That's what they're they're kind of uh, foisting on you, uh, this these god-like characteristics, all right? So divine has to do with, with God, all right? Um, so not only does Jesus have divine names, godly names, but he also possesses divine what? Um, um, divine knowledge is actually pretty good. Yeah, that would divine knowledge. What would we call that? What's the special word for divine knowledge? Close. Omniscience is divine knowledge, right? All knowing. So wait, don't write this down yet. So he possesses divine what? Things like all-knowing. What else? You said omnipotent, all-powerful. Um, what do we call those things? Characteristics. Characteristics are great. Attributes, right? Characteristics or attributes, that's exactly right. So he possesses divine attributes. He has attributes that only God has. That's what divine, divine attributes would be attributes that only God has, or characteristics that only God has. So he's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. Jesus is present everywhere. Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Right? Uh, Jesus is present in um, the bread and the wine of the sacrament of the altar every Sunday as we celebrate it. Right? Jesus is all-present. Um, what else is he? Um, I don't know what are some of the other characteristics, divine uh, attributes or characteristics of Jesus. Um, he is forgiving. He is merciful. He is all loving, right? Uh, First John tells us that God is love, but uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus is loving. All right, so these are our, our divine attributes, attributes that God has. Um, and then he also does divine things, divine works. And uh, so what are some of the divine works that he does? Um, 
walking on water, that would be a, a divine work. Uh, in fact, any kind of miracle would be a divine work. Creating earth. Uh, creation would be a divine work. Yeah, very good, right? Uh, forgiving is a divine work. When, when the paralytic, you remember the story of the guys who chopped the hole in the roof and they let their paralyzed friend down and Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven. And the, and the church leaders, all the Pharisees and, and, and Sadducees, they go, who, who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, well, that's the point. Who is Jesus? God. Right? He does divine works like forgiveness. Um, so, oh, and then fourth. I guess there was a fourth one. Sorry. Uh, he receives divine blank and blank. Uh, this one's probably harder to uh, be intuitive about the blanks. Um, uh, so so uh, he heals the ten lepers. You remember that story? The ten lepers, the guys with leprosy cry out, Jesus, have mercy on us, right? And uh, Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priests. Because that's what you're supposed to do if you get healed. If you get healed of leprosy, if the leprosy goes away, you go and show yourself to the priest, and then you can resume your life. But a, a leper, you remember a leper from Sunday school lessons, right? They can't live with their families. They can't live in the towns. They're kind of outcasts. And so Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. And on their way, they go, holy crap, no more leprosy, right? Because you can see it, right? You can see no more leprosy. And... Uh, uh, one comes back, and what does he do? Jesus. He falls on his knees at Jesus' feet and um, praises him and gives him honor and glory. So uh, that's the; uh, those are the blanks. He receives divine honor and glory. And what doesn't Jesus say? Jesus doesn't say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait! Don't worship me." Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus allows allows that healed man to worship him. He allows him to worship him because he is God. Now, if you remember the story in Acts, Paul and Barnabas are in, uh, hmm, where are they, Ephesus maybe? Or uh, I feel like it's Ephesus. And Paul, Paul heals somebody. Paul heals somebody or... Uh, uh, something happens, some miracle. Paul does some miracle. And the people think that uh, Paul is uh, um, uh, Apollo and Barnabas is Zeus. And they come and they want to sacrifice a bull and they want to worship these gods that have taken on flesh. What's this fancy word that we use for taking on flesh by God? Incarnation. Incarnation, right? So uh, these people think that Paul and Barnabas are the gods incarnate, and they want to and they want to worship them. And what does Paul say? No, 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 no. We are not God, but we'll tell you who God is, right? Um, so Jesus receives divine honor and glory. Could you even say divine worship? But um, divine honor and glory works. So Jesus, as we look at the scripture, Jesus then is. Uh, fully, um, what, wait, what's this say? Jesus is fully what? God. God. How often? All the time. All the time. He is fully God all the time. He is not man sometimes and he's not God sometimes. He doesn't oscillate. He, sometimes he's God and sometimes he's man. That's not how it works. He's not man all the time and not God. He's not God all the time and not man. He's God all the time. And guess what the blank down below is? Jesus is fully man all the time. Right? Jesus is fully man all the time is the one that's down below um, in the bold print. We can get to it in a second. But, but that's um, so 100% God, 100% man. Not 50-50. Not 100% and 0 sometimes and 100% and or 0 and 100% other times. He is 100% God, 100% man all the time. Can we explain how that's possible? No. Nope. It's one of the mysteries of faith, right? We are not God, and so we do not know, we do not know how that is possible. All right, um, <clears throat> so just like we know that Jesus is true God, Scripture reveals all of these, uh, all of these things that point to Jesus as being true God. It also points to all these ways that Jesus is true man. And so, um, probably the biggest one, right? So he has divine names up above. Well, 
people call, or um, the scriptures call Jesus a man. man, right? They call Jesus a man. He calls himself son of man. Um, scripture is very, very uh, 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 purposeful in um, uh, identifying Jesus as a man. Right? He's born of Virgin Mary. Um, uh, scriptures also say that he has a human body and soul. That's exactly right. Scriptures say that he has human body and souls. And then the scripture also speaks of his um, uh, human but sinless what? Emotions. Emotions, feelings. Emotions or feelings, either work. And he slept, he ate, he drank. He walked, Please. he talked, actions. He did things humans do. He did things humans do. So he sleeps in a boat when there's a storm. He uh, eats food with his disciples. Right? He, he cries. Um, and uh, uh, he not only cries human action, but then he's sad about Lazarus dying. Right? He's sad and he cries when Lazarus dies. So, um, right, human feelings and actions. Um, and so Jesus is fully man all the time. Right? Jesus is fully man all the time. So, let's take a look in Catechism, uh, the question 159. 159. And um, this is, uh, Catechism will give us the answer, but I, I like reading... Uh, I like you reading in the Catechism because it uh, kind of says this is a useful book. Right? This is a useful book. You should keep your Catechism. After you get confirmed, you should have your Catechism and keep your Catechism. Um, make use of it um, as your kids grow up. Make use of it for yourself. Right? A great devotional book. Re refresh and remember things. You can you know, read through the Catechism from time to time for your personal devotional life. Uh, Etc. So it's good to read out of the catechism um, here in confirmation class, even though it'll be pretty easy. It'll be just kind of fill in the blank stuff, but uh, we'll fill in the blank and, and uh, talk about it. So why was it important for us as sinners that Jesus was truly man? So Jesus is God and man for a purpose, and, and there's a purpose that he's truly God, and there's a purpose that he's truly man. Um, and it, it really centers on, what would you guess that it centers on? Why is it important that Jesus is true God and true man? Just give me a, a quick answer for that. Don't look in your catechism. Why is it important that Jesus is true God and true man? Why do you think? For your what? Um, so that he could die and suffer and so that he can raise himself from the dead. So that could, you can be saved. be saved, right? For your salvation. So don't write anything down yet. But this is why it's important that Jesus is both God and man, because in being God and man, he is able to save you from your sins. All right? And then, so there are some specifics, and Leo gave us some specifics that will come up here in just a second, which is fine, no problem with the specifics, but the specifics then will flesh out um, how that works and what that looks like. So, uh, Catechism question 159 why is it important for sinners that Jesus, or that the Son of God has become our brother? Which means that he is a man, a human, right? Why is it important that Jesus was truly man? That's how I wrote the question. So letter A, as our brother, Jesus fulfilled our obligation to keep the law. That is called, um, so you can fill in the blanks there, right? Keep the law. Jesus fulfilled our obligation to keep the law. Remember what does God tell us in the Old Testament? Jesus even says in the New Testament, Be blank, for I, the Lord your God, am blank. Four letter word starts with H. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's what God demands. God demands perfection. Why does God demand perfection? So that you can be saved. What's the problem with demanding perfection in order to be saved? Harrison. What's the problem 
for God to say, Harrison, you need to be perfect and you'll be saved. What's the problem with that statement? Nobody can be perfect, right? But that's the obligation. The obligation as a human person under the law of God is to be perfect. That's your obligation. So what does Jesus do? He comes and keeps the law perfectly because you can't. All right? And that's called his active obedience. Do you know English? English. Well, you speak English, but do you know English? Have you talked about like active verbs and passive verbs? Yeah. Do you know what an active verb is? What's an active verb? Running. Running, jumping is something that you are actually doing. Something you're actually doing. So Jesus is actually keeping the law. He's doing the right thing is to keep the law. All right. Letter B. Jesus also, it, it was uh, important for him to be true man, because Jesus, as true man, Jesus was able, this is what um, uh, Leo said a second ago. It happens. I don't know what it is. I have these uh, glitches sometimes. Um, uh, Jesus was true man so that he could suffer and die to pay the penalty for our sin. And this is called his passive, passive obedience. Why is that passive obedience? Because a passive verb is something that is done. An active verb is something that you do. A passive verb is something that is done to you. That's exactly right. A passive verb is something that is done to you. So uh, uh, Leo was hit by the ball. That's passive verb. Right? That makes sense? Right? Leo was hit by everyone's fists. Huh? So was the word. Was hit. Right? It's a compound verb. What? Why is he getting hit? Because he's going to a cotillion. No, I'm, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a great. That's a. It's actually a good thing. I'm just. Thanks for having my back. Because he's a pretty boy. Pretty. Boy. No, I'm not helping at all. Yeah. Right. Your mom wants you to dance, and I'm calling you a pretty boy. So it's like, wow. And Leo's gonna be curled up in his bed crying tonight. All right. So, uh, all right. So passive obedience. Jesus suffered and died for our sins. All right. um, and that happens to him. He is crucified. Right? He doesn't crucify himself. He doesn't put the nails in his hands and in his feet. He is, he is crucified by others. Others crucify him. And he dies for our sins. All right? Passive obedience. Now, Catechism question 159, C and B. C and B. Nope. Oh, no. 159C and 160B. That's what it is. Um, the catechism uh, changed on me, and so I have to uh, do a little bit of creative stuff sometimes in order to keep the questions that I've had for years and years and years. Um, so why is it important for us sinners that Jesus was truly God? So letter C on 159. Jesus did what? overcame death so that we too can be raised from the dead. So, um, uh, he overcame death and the... What do we always say? The devil, right? He overcame death and the devil for us. He overcame death and the devil for us. And then, um, 160, letter P. Why is it important that... Um, the man Jesus, our brother, is also the Son of God who created the universe. Right? And letter A is fine. And letter C, he's always with us. Those are good things. He intercedes before the Father. Right? There's all kinds of good answers there. But but really the the other real uh, important answer here, why he was truly God, is so that his death would be a sufficient ransom for all people. Um, only the perfect Son of God could be a sacrifice for sin. The Bible tells us, the book of Hebrews tells us that 
none of the sacrifices in the Old Testament paid for anybody's sins. They only pointed ahead toward Jesus, who's that perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right? All right. So, we're going to skip page 27. We're going to skip page 28. All right? And, um... I'd rather have the doors open. Are they doing conferences? They are doing conferences for preschoolers. Preschool? Hmm. Wait, what do they call? Yeah, yeah, we do I all, don't remember having... How we do... Nah, no, I didn't even have preschool. Legal I don't know. I didn't go to I didn't even have preschool. I didn't go to preschool either. There was no preschool. Nobody had preschool when I was a kid. My dad says he doesn't want to go, but then it got burned down. Oh. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right. So, all right, our next lesson. So Jesus, true God, true man. Very important that he's true God and true man. We don't say words like it was necessary for him to be. Necessary isn't the right word. It's just, it's important that he was true God and true man. And so he is true God and true man for us and for our salvation. And, and in his active obedience and in his passive obedience, um, Jesus uh, does these things and has them done to him, right, for us and for our salvation. All right, so lesson nine is the next one. So this is the second topic. There's three main topics that we're going to talk about with Jesus. The first one was that he's true God and true man. And the second one is that he has some offices. He he holds, like, president, right, as an office or, uh, um, I don't know, congregational president as an office. Um, pastor is an office in the church. So there are these offices that Jesus um, holds um, as true God and true man, all right? And then the third topic that we'll talk about is um, uh, kind of the process of his uh, humiliation and exaltation is what it's called, and his being made low and his being exalted, made high, uh, again, for us and for our salvation. So so the second one then is how, how, what are these offices that Jesus holds as true God and true man? So read that first paragraph for us. What is an office, Walter? Now a little louder so the video camera can hear you. God created three offices to serve his Old Testament people, prophet, priest, and king. That's the, oh, the first paragraph. I don't know what I said, but I sure said, meant said, the first yes, paragraph. Yes, yeah. I said the first paragraph? Yes. All right. The office is a job which has a particular set of duties and responsibilities, which there are certain requirements that must be fulfilled. All right, so in the office of pastor, right, I fulfill the office of pastor. There are certain requirements. I, for To be a Lutheran pastor, I need to go to the seminary. Um, I need to... Uh, um, Passed my classes. I needed to learn Greek and Hebrew. I needed right there are there are certain things I need to lead a uh, now that I am in the office of pastor and right, I need to lead a, a godly life right. I can't be a drunkard or a womanizer. Um, those are not fitting with the office. So there's some there are some uh, responsibilities and duties that I need to follow as a pastor. Right? I can't just walk up to people and smack them upside the head unless your name's Peter. Right? So um, again, you know, some of the fathers were really glad. Your dad, in fact, was glad that that was on camera, and it wasn't on camera last week. There's no actual proof that I did that. <laughs> Um, so there's so there are these uh, these duties and responsibilities, right? You just there there are um, to be a pastor. There are certain things, and and Paul lists a whole bunch of them in like First Timothy chapter three, for instance. Um, and then like as a, a president, right? There are duties and responsibilities that a president needs to attend to. The president uh, can't just sleep till noon every day. The president can't. Um, um, I don't know, not whatever, not miss meetings and uh, 
um, miss important events, and right, he can't do that. There's duties and responsibilities that he has to do. When he has to appear before Congress, he has to appear before Congress. He can't just say, eh, I don't really feel like going up to Capitol Hill today, right? There's duties and responsibilities. So these uh, offices, God, God makes these three offices, prophet, priest, and king, in the Old Testament to assist and help his people, all right? And those are prophet, priest, and king. And, as, and the prophets and the priests and the kings uh, all worked in order to benefit God's people. And there were um, duties and responsibilities that, that they had. And um, yeah. con who's considered the greatest of these, of these, uh, of these um, offices? So who was considered in the Old Testament to be the greatest prophet? Here it says Moses. You are correct. Moses is the correct one. Moses was seen as the greatest prophet. And who was seen as the greatest priest? A guy named Melchizedek. And and maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, well, and who is considered to be the greatest king before Leo objects? I'll answer his objection in a minute. David, right? So you have Moses, Melchizedek, and David, and you go, who the heck is Melchizedek? Um well, Melchizedek was a uh, priest at the time of Abraham. Very good. At the time of Abraham. And um, so instead of the word greatest, instead of the word greatest, you might substitute kind of the, uh, uh, who was considered kind of the uh, arc typical uh, prophet, priest, and king. Maybe not the greatest, uh, because I'm not sure that Melchizedek was necessarily the greatest priest. To name a greatest priest would be difficult. Uh, Moses is actually, so you should have objected about the priest, not about Moses. Moses is considered by the Jews to be the greatest prophet. And, and David is definitely considered by the Jews to be the greatest king. Melchizedek is kind of an odd priest, and we'll talk about why Melchizedek um, when we look up a Bible passage, but Melchizedek is not, um, is not a priest like we think about after Moses. So, um, uh, you know, when they came out of, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, right, on Mount Sinai, God gave them the Ten Commandments, and then he gave them all kinds of other laws, and and he said, you're going to build a, a house of worship called a tabernacle, and this is how you're going to build it. And then you're going, to, you're going to have this sacrifice system, and you're going to slaughter animals. And in the slaughtering of those animals, uh, and they're shedding of blood, I will forgive your sins. And the guys who are going to do that are going to be called priests, right? Priests are going to do this sacrificing for you so that your sins can be forgiven. And so um, Moses' brother... Name is Aaron. Aaron and his sons become the priests of Israel. And uh, so their tasks, all the way down, generation after generation, you have to be able to translate, trans, um, you have to be able to point all the way back to Aaron to be a priest in Israel. And so uh, these priests were the ones then that sacrificed for the sins of the people. And uh, so we know that. But before, before Moses and before God formalizes all that, there were other priests that people came to and, and, uh, and uh, who offered sacrifices for people's sins, etc. And one of those priests at the time of Abraham was a guy named Melchizedek. And he was actually a king and a priest of, um, of uh, I feel like uh, Jerusalem, but it wasn't called Jerusalem at the time. Anyway, he was kind of a king priest, and Moses went to him and uh, uh, had him sacrifice and gave an offering to God after a uh, battle that Abraham and his men won. Yes, Leo? But the reason why I disagree with Moses... Uh, 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 well, let me speak. I am. Spit it out. I wanna, what about Isaiah? Because he talks about the promise of Jesus the most. Because uh, this is the most important thing. Yeah, you're wrong. Anyway, um, so, so, um, why don't you read the paragraph about Moses then? This would be really good, really good for you to read. 
But isn't Jesus... Just, 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 just read. Nice and loud for the camera. Oh, so straight. Be loud. Straight. How should Moses was you should the already, greatest prophet You should already be learning, right? Feet flat on the floor. So nice and straight. Project your voice. Moses was Think the you're going to learn tonight. <laughs> just let him talk. All right, fire away. <laughs> Oh, Moses was the so greatest. Alright. Moses. Would you read already? <laughs> we don't have all night. Moses was the greatest prophet of Israel. Ah! Look at that. You right. have Keep going. Though Moses. No, nope, through. Through Moses, God gave Israel the Ten Commandments and all of its other laws. God also used Moses, Moses to lead children of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt, through the desert, and to the borders of the Promised Land. Moses kept all the people of Israel together and together and hopeful during the really hard times when they were when they either wanted to give up or fight with them wanting each other. Uh, the Israelites respected Moses even more than Americans respected George Washington because they knew God spoke through him and rescued their nation. All right, so a prophet is someone who speaks for God, right? That God speaks through to the people. A uh, prophet is someone who speaks um, for God. And uh, Moses is considered the greatest prophet of the Old Testament because th this is what Moses did, right? From the burning bush all the way through the Exodus and, and beyond for 40 years in the wilderness, providing God's word for the people, uh, calling the people to repent, offering God's forgiveness to the people when they did repent, setting up the sacrifice system so that the people could find forgiveness in God. This is all Moses speaking for God. And, and, and I agree, Isaiah, important and lots of important things to say uh, during the, during the uh, what, uh, about, uh, what, uh, Wasn't it I don't know, a few hundred years before the Babylonian captivity, Isaiah warning Israel to repent, etc., but see, Moses kind of kicks this all off. And he's, he's the greatest.